again and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host for the next hour of answering your gardening questions. If you'd like to get in touch with us now, please dial 1-800-676-5446. If you'd like to send us an email and some pictures for a future show, that address is byf at unl.edu. Please tell us where you live, give us as much information as you can so we can help you with the best solution. I'd also like to invite you to head over to our YouTube channel after the show. Check out those past programs and those video features. You can also follow us during the week on our Facebook page. And as always, we've got some samples to start with. So Wayne, what is that and why did you bring it? Well, I brought several of them. And it's plum time. They're starting to turn green. They're getting a little bigger, so they're getting noticeable on the tree. But it's also the time when plum curculio will be laying eggs into those plums. And you can tell it's plum curculio because they have a crescent shaped scar on that plum where they've laid that egg. So that egg's in this plum, it will hatch and it'll feed on the inside and then it will drop down to the soil and pupate. Unfortunately in Nebraska because of all of our wild plums we have plentiful plum curculio and you will lose most of your plums if you haven't already sprayed. Uh, you're a little late at this point in time, especially if you're south of me, because these are from up in Norfolk. So if you're way south of that, you're way too late for the position period. And the best thing you can do is pick off any with scars and get them disposed of so they're not in your landscape for next year. All right. Thank you, Wayne. All right, Matt, what is it? All right, we got summer, summer annual weed season coming up here. So all the summer annuals are gonna be doing really well here in the next month, two months. So now is the time, if you have it, to go out there and investigate to see if you have these summer annuals like crabgrass. If you did not get a pre-emergent down or if you have areas where the pre-emergent didn't work well, I'm just starting to see in turf that's fairly healthy, thicker stand, uh, small crabgrass coming up out of the ground. Um, and it's still treatable at this stage if we haven't treated yet. Uh, some of the products that work as a post would be Dimension or Dithiopyr, and that one actually works as a post on crabgrass. And here's another one that was in, in between a couple bricks, so it's already in the two to three tiller stage, so it's a little bit bigger. Obviously it had more time to warm up and it's growing very vigorously and fast, uh, but this one also is still treatable. Dimension, I think, goes up to three to five tiller, uh, as a post, and that is the only pre-emergent project or product that has post activity and pre-activity. So if we put it down later in the year after we see it, it'll still control crabgrass. Uh, another product would be quinclorac, and that one covers post uh, on a lot of your summer annual grassy weeds. So that would be another option if you need to control these weeds. All right, or you just mow it because it's green. Or you let it be if you do have a brown lawn like me, and then it'll be green, so. <laughs> All right. That's what I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kyle, uh, way too early for that to be looking like that. Yeah, this is the new variety of pears with yellow leaves. Maybe we could call it that. No, it's actually it's not um, a pear. It's an I apple. That was an it's apple. An apple. Okay. I don't do plant ID. That's why, that's why you don't let me do plant of the week. Um, but this, uh, this is apple scab. Um, this is caused by a fungus, the uh, Venturia inequalis is the scientific name of, that, of this fungus. And as Kim had mentioned, this is a couple of weeks early for, to, to, um, for what we would normally see, but one of the defining features of scab is it will just turn your leaves yellow. And occasionally we'll even, we'll see some, we'll see a leaf spot on there. And if we would go and look at that spot under magnification, we would see, we would see the spores. Um, and this is how the, this fungus overwinters on, on the leaves. And so one of the best ways to control this is actually raking up your leaves in the fall and making sure that you are destroying all of the, all of the leaf tissue. Um, because then in the spring, once we get warm temperatures and some moisture, I didn't think we had near enough moisture this year, but apparently we did. But you get that moisture and then those spores on the fallen leaves will blow up onto the, onto the tree and cause, cause infection. Now, if it's just a, um, just a, tree, a tree in your landscape, typically this sort of um, yellowing or, chlor or chlorosis isn't going to cause a major problem. Um, it may cause some early defoliation, but unless we have that defoliation occurring for a few year, years in a row, it's not going to um, negatively impact the long-term health of the tree. In a commercial setting, 
or if it's a high value tree, uh, fungicides are available. Um, a product that, would con um, that contains uh, propiconazole or chlorothalonil works pretty well, and you'd want to be applying that fungicide um, kind of at the first signs of first sign of infection. So right about now is when you'd want to get that fungicide out. All right, thank you, Kyle. Elizabeth, your turn. It's pruning time. Um, we usually don't say that this time of the year, but when we're talking those spring uh, flowering shrubs, now is the time once they're done flowering to go ahead and prune. So last year, I didn't prune this lilac here and you can tell that the capsules are located right there. Now this, sh this branch did not bloom this year because that capsule was there. So if I wanna encourage blooming next year, on these I'm gonna find the spent flowers on the ends of the branch branches and then I'm going to take my trusty pruning shears and I'm going to prune it back to the next branch union and just remove those on there. So if we're talking about pruning these spring flowering shrubs, um, you can go ahead and you can remove any of these um, spent flower blossoms that are on there. Now this guy does tend to seed itself, so I'm probably going to try a little bit harder this year to go ahead and remove those spent flowers so that way it doesn't uh, put on as many seeds and I don't have as many volunteers in my landscape. Excellent, thank you very much. All right, Wayne, first round of questions is yours. Uh, this first one comes to us from North Bend, and she wonders whether this is a sawfly, that lovely bright blue thing, eating her golden lysimachia, which is a ground cover, and she wants to know if it is, how does she control it? It is. Um, when I got in close, you can't quite see the head, so I'm not sure which soft fly this is for sure. But I was able to find that uh, grass soft fly does get into this plant uh, on occasion. Um, they are heavily parasitized by wasps, so you shouldn't have too many of them getting around or reproducing, and it's one generation a year. So what you see now is what you get, and you won't get any more until next year. All right. Pick it off if you really want to control it. Good to know. All right, uh, your second one comes to us from Polk. The picture is from last year, had issues the previous year also. This is larva in the stems of the pumpkins, and then, of course, they slowly begin to die off starting at the root. She wants to know how to prevent that from happening this okay, year. Okay, so this is squash <clears throat> vine borer. If you want to prevent it, you have to be really good about spraying the vines themselves, especially at the larger portions near the joints. Um, if you're going to do chemical control. You can also, once you've set on enough pumpkins on those vines and you're comfortable with what you're going to get, you can use the floating row covers uh, to keep those moths off of there from laying the eggs. If you do do chemical control, be really careful not to put the chemicals on the flowers. Moths don't tend those flowers for the eggs, so you're not going to get them exposed. So try not to do that because you'll expose your pollinators because they are very attractive to many of our pollinators. All right. Let's see, one more. And this is a Waterloo viewer and is wondering, what is this bee? It is drilling perfectly round holes in the beams. And we had another question from a viewer who said 20 of them drilling holes in the beams. Yes, these are carpenter bees. You can tell because there's no yellow hair on the abdomen. It's actually very little hair at all on the abdomen and it's yellow on the thorax with that black dot in the center. That's pretty characteristic. You don't need to see more than that. Uh, they do tend to leave treated wood products alone. So if you can, it looks like this may be due for some restaining or some repainting. Um, that's one way to discourage them from getting into your outdoor wood products, um, whether it be the green treat, stain, or paint. That's the best thing you can do at this point in time um, to, to discourage them. Should you fill the holes if you've got some? Oh, they'll just dig them right back out. And don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Real carpenters. Sir. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Wayne. Okay, Matt, your first one. Uh, this is just a single picture from this Lincoln viewer, and he says he has this very ugly section in his front yard and he wonders on how to proceed to try to get it to look better. Okay, so what this looks like is it's kind of just a hot spot maybe, or when that sidewalk was put in, maybe some of the soil is not as good as the rest of the lawn. Uh, so what you wanna do here is probably you're gonna have to water it a little bit more and maybe up the fertility just a little bit to try and get it to match the rest of the lawn. So water is gonna be important, especially right next to the sidewalk there. I don't know if it's a south facing slope, but it's gonna catch a lot more sunlight and dry out a lot sooner. 
Uh, so water fertilization, and if you have other issues, maybe make sure you're getting grub control down because it's weak already, and uh, that would make it look even worse if you're going to have any issues this year. All right, thanks, Matt. Two pictures on this next one, too. This is also a Lincoln viewer. Um, the, the home was built about nine years ago. They used a thin-bladed fescue developed for this area, and then all of a sudden they've got this uh, blue-green patches, and they're wondering what this is and how to control this. Okay, so what this looks like to me is creeping bent grass, and it's more of a grass that's used on golf courses. Uh, a lot of the putting greens around here are creeping bent grass and some of the, some of the fairways and tee boxes. Uh, when you get it at lawn height, it does kind of have that limish green color and it's pretty fluffy and it'll keep spreading year after year and growing within your lawn uh, of tall fescue. Uh, so, you know, one way to do that would be to try and rip it out of there or uh, glyphosate app, which isn't pretty because it's just going to be a big dead brown spot and then you seed in some of your tall fescue to match the rest of your lawn because it will continue to grow bigger uh, without getting the sample in and actually IDing it. Uh, I'm not 100% positive, but that's kind of what I've seen those patches look like creeping bent grass. Okay, and if you can't bring a sample, at least some really, really close up pics. Yes. Okay, all right, Kyle, two pictures on this one. Mm -hmm. This is a Little Sioux, Iowa viewer, 50 miles north of Council Bluffs. Weird growths just appeared and they've never had anything like this before. What are they and how do they get rid of them? You don't want to get rid of these because these are one of the coolest organisms alive. These are slime molds. Um, and so it's the and slime molds, they are, they're, they're just feeding on cellu um, cellulose. They're not harming anything. They're not toxic. Um, they're, they're just a fun, a fun treat of nature. They kind of appear overnight, especially after moisture or if you've been over watering and then once it dries, once the weather dries out, they dry out and they turn to dust, and maybe you'll have them again next year if you're lucky. All right, thank you. You have one picture on this next one. Uh, this is a, a Lincoln viewer, raised beds. They added bag topsoil, and now they have shrooms that keep growing from below. They wonder how to get rid of them, and people keep telling them that means they have good soil, but they're taking over where he wants to plant vegetables. Uh, Fortunately, as far as getting rid of them, the best thing that you can do is just going to be remove them by hand. Um, they, this is, as far as what type it is, I'm not entirely sure. It's some sort of bolete. Um, I wondered about a lepiota, but the, the, um, the stipe or the stem is a little bit too thick, so I'm not, not entirely sure. But it is some sort of bolete that is harmless. Um, so it's not going to be toxic to, to yourself, pets, um, children, anything like that. Best way to get rid of it will just be hand, um, removing them by hand um, because they are, there's a big, they're, like, they're kind of like an iceberg. The main, the most of that fungus is underground, feeding on rotten, rotting wood material. So until that wood is gone, the mushrooms will come back. All right, thanks. And one picture on this next one, and this is a back and forth potentially. This is a North Bend viewer who has iris getting progressively worse. Uh, bulbs are rotted and holes in the bottom, so he's wondering is the roots rotting leaving the holes or are the iris bores there first and then rotting? And how do you get rid of whatever's going on? Yeah, so I, I, I think that it's actually Wayne's problem first and then it would come to me. <laughs> um, but so I, I think it's so um, the, 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 the virus, the, the, um, the cane bore, what happens is as it's, as it's feeding, it causes a bunch of wounds and that opens the, opens the plant up for root rots. Um, one of the big ones that iris will get is a bacterial root rot, and so I would bet that this, um, this material is almost kind of soft as well, and probably doesn't smell too good. Unfortunately, with our bacterial soft rots, there's really not a whole lot that we can do aside from removal of the plant. And as far as controlling the, controlling the bugs, I would say just make sure that you're pruning them as you should. Yeah, so I've, I've, one of my master gardeners is big in the iris society and she schooled me on the two schools of thought on managing iris. One is you don't clip them off and the other one is you do. Um, when you clip off the iris leaves, you time of year you do that about midsummer, 
you take out the iris borer, which is, starts at the tip of the leaf and works its way down. Mm -hmm. So then you, you manage it that way. So if you don't wanna just level them all off, you can just keep an eye out and watch for that tunnel starting down from the tips and you can clip it before it gets down to the, to the root. Perfect. All right, Elizabeth, two pictures on this first one. This is an O'Neill viewer. Um, she says there was established landscape and it's now all run together. Vinca columbine, et cetera, et cetera, hostas and tulips. She wonders what and when. So we have kind of a mixture of both sun and shade in there. Um, when we're talking about moving iris, uh, we're gonna move those usually in July. Um, on the second picture, I think that the daylily could possibly be those orange old fashioned daylilies that go like gangbusters. So if that is the case and they bloom orange, those things are gonna be a garden thug and you have to be prepared for them to go ahead and spread. Um, but you know, taking a look, um, determining what you wanna keep and then taking a look at your design and where you wanna put them. Putting things in masses is gonna give you more bang for your buck. So by grouping your iris together, um, you're gonna be able to get more of a show when they do flower. And don't do it in the middle of July when it's way too hot. Well, it's always way too hot in July. But. <laughs> <laughs> all right, two pictures on this next one. This is a classic because we have this all over. This is Carl Forster feather reed grass. Uh, this is what they look like with new shoots unthrifty. So what, what does he do here? Your best bet is probably going to be replacement. Um, we saw a lot of death and dieback in the ornamental grasses this past year. Even if you leave them in, it's going to look like that for a while until it starts to fill in. So if you don't like the way they look right now, they're not going to get any better. So replacement's going to be your best bet. You know, if we continue to have dry conditions where that is located in an inferno strip between two driveways, you want to make sure that you provide them that supplemental moisture um, so that way they don't dry out too much and we get winter kill. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Well, good gardening starts with taking care of your soil. Healthy soil contains lots of organic matter, and one amendment you might consider is biochar. For our first feature tonight, UNL agronomy and horticulture PhD student Britt Fossum talks about the different kinds of biochar and how to incorporate it into your home landscape. <music> Biochar is not a new material necessarily, but it's becoming uh, an increasingly popular or interesting option uh, as an additive for soil, for potting mix, for compost. Um, and it is essentially very similar to charcoal, except it is produced with the goal of using it in soil. And so a lot of the properties may be specifically designed uh, to be good for that purpose. So it's basically just charcoal with a different purpose. It can be made from a lot of different things and that's actually something really important to look into before purchasing your biochar. Think about what you're using it for. So biochar made from different materials. Um, it can be made from basically any kind of waste uh, plant material. So wood, grass, uh, walnut shells, which is actually some of what I have. And all of those different kind of materials that it can be made from impact what type of biochar you get out. So, and it has a wide range of applications. Some of the, some of the issues that it can help address with your soil uh, are really anything from, if you have too sandy of a soil, if you have a soil that's been compacted, if you have a soil with low pH, if you have a soil that is just kind of low fertility in general. So because it has such a wide range of applications, you need to do your research before purchasing anything. So biochar made from a material like wood is generally going to have the highest carbon content, which is good if you're trying to increase organic matter in your garden uh, and biochar produced from other materials like compost, grasses um, and other plants. Uh, may have slightly higher nutrient content and may have a little bit more porosity. Uh, some of the other parameters are what happens after the biochar is made. Uh, there's a really wide range of biochar size. So again, this gets into what you're using it for. If you're using it to amend a sandy soil so that you can have a little bit better water retention, a little bit more 
uh, organic matter in there, you're going to want to look for a biochar with smaller particle size so that it can help really aggregate that soil and do what you want it to. If you're looking for it as an option as a bulking agent in a potting mix, as something to add to your compost, or as something to mix into a really dense clay soil or to remedy compaction, you're gonna to wanna to look for a biochar with larger particle size. So something up to maybe four millimeters. So biochar is sold dry, and there are a couple different ways you might wanna prepare it before adding it into your soil. One way is mixing with compost uh, in a 50-50 ratio. Uh, one way is soaking it with water for about 24 hours. Um, and all of those can help reduce erosion or keep it from blowing away. Keeping your soil healthy is the best way to help you succeed in any gardening project, and that biochar could help you enrich your soil with plenty of organic matter, as well as, you know, being fun to write with. All right, Wayne, two pictures for this one. Wondering what these tiny creatures on her iris are. Hasn't seen them any other year or an iris on different parts of the garden. Okay, okay. before we flip to the second picture, there's two things here. Mm -hmm. Oh, they flipped. <laughs> <laughs> there was the slightly larger black object and then all the little tiny brown ones. So a slightly larger black object was an insidious flower bug. It's on that left flower. Okay. And about middle, halfway down. Uh, that's actually there eating the thrips, which are the little brown loose things flying everywhere and okay. making your iris flowers not look so nice. Okay, thrips, thripses. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, one picture on this next one. This comes to us from Oto. County, uh, this is baby kale and all these little things and he thinks they're cabbage aphids and he's wondering how to control them on his baby kale. Yeah, that poor kale just looks nasty. Yeah. And the fun thing is he's actually got parasitic wasps that have hit those because mm -hmm. the light brown ones have already been parasitized and there's a wasp pupa inside of it that will pop out a wasp shortly. And a lot of those other ones are, are looking rather bulbous, which they do right before they turn that tan color. So I think you've got a lot of these have been parasitized. Mm -hmm. I would not recommend spraying any uh, chemical control on this. If you wanna protect some of your kale, hose it off with the hose and go that route. All right, thanks. And one picture on this one. Uh, this is a Southwestern exposure, 20 year old. This is a uh, hawthorn. And he's wondering if this is winter damage. Extension apparently thought it was leaf miners. It is. There, there is a hawthorn leaf miner that is a sawfly, among all things, um, that hits the very tips of the leaves. Mm -hmm. uh, there's only one generation a year. They'll drop out down to the soil to pupate until next year. Your newer growth will come in and cover that up. So at this point, no big do deal. nothing. All it right. won't harm the tree. Thank you. Two for you, Matt. Uh, this is the poison hemlock question, and the question is, is this it on these two pictures, and how to safely remove and dispose of it? And yes, I would say by looking at it, it does look like poison ivy. Hemlock. Um, or poison hemlock. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're, they're both poisonous. <laughs> so, but yeah, so this one, removing it, the sooner the better. So when you see this come out, I mean, obviously it kind of, has that nature of like a carrot almost, it has that look. And so the best way to get rid of it would be just to dig it out, go deep, probably at least one foot if you can with a tile spade and pop it out and then just throw it in a bag, throw it in the trash, get rid of it. That way you're not rubbing your rubbing it on your hands or stuff like that. So long sleeves and gloves and shouldn't have any issues with uh, getting it on yourself. All right, uh, two pictures on this next one and this is an Omaha viewer. Uh, she was worried that this was poison ivy. Uh, she does say she did get a bad rash, but she's not sure whether it was from this. So she wants to know what it is and how to get rid of it. So this isn't poison ivy, unlike the last one that wasn't either. But <laughs> this one is actually more of a vine. It's a perennial uh, woody species, uh, Boston ivy. And this one will actually grow up uh, upwards of 50 to 60 feet on brick buildings. You'll see it on a lot of these older buildings that are covered in this. Uh, so getting rid of this one, if your neighbor does have it, uh, might be a little bit difficult, but you wanna get down and probably dig these out as well. And what I did find is if you wanna treat for them, if they're coming up and you have not too many of them coming up, uh, the late, late summer and early fall, 
treating them with like a glyphosate application on the leaves before they start turning colors or turning red for the fall. And they'll actually absorb that down into the plant, into the root system, and that will hopefully kill them for good. The other option would be to trim them off and treat with glyphosate, which I don't know if that works as good on those like trees, probably not, no, because they're growing too vigorously. Uh, so that would be an option to get rid of them. And then another thing is these two can be poisonous, the leaves. Uh, so you want to make sure if it is in the area, I think it's mostly to animals, dogs and cats, and even humans if it's ingested. So that would be one thing to get rid of uh, earlier than later. All right, thank you very much. Kyle, uh, this is a fine line buckthorn with the rust. Anything to do about it? Two pictures on this one. Um, no, it's the, as with all the rust, once you start to see those pustules show up, there's really, really nothing to do. Um, if you really care about it, a fungicide application two to three weeks ago would have been effective. All right, two picks on the next one, and uh, this is a viewer growing lamb's quarter as an organic crop, and it's got these little purples on it. Anything she should do or not? Uh, no, not that I would worry about, and I'm not entirely sure what this is. I think it's actually a hypersensitive response to a bacterial disease, because lamb's quarter has, will do that. It will turn purple um, to try to kill off some cells, but I don't think it's anything to worry about. All right, and one picture on the next one. This is a Wahoo Nebraska viewer who found uh, this ugly thing on a rosemary, and she says it's on her parsley potentially too. Any yeah. ideas? Again, you're lucky. This is another slime mold. Um, there is a uh, crown gall can get on rosemary as well, but typically with a crown gall, you wouldn't you would expect there to be some some distortion of the of the leaf material around that gall. But whereas this just kind of envelops the the leaf the leafy material. Really looks like a slime mold, so let it dry off, and it should should go away just fine. Excellent. All right, uh, Elizabeth, she just wants to one uh, wants to know what these two plants are, or this one plant in the shade next to a wooded area. Virginia water leaf. Um, there's two different species to it. Both of them get about a foot and a half to two foot tall. Technically, it's edible. Don't know why you'd want to eat it, but um, it can get somewhat invasive or aggressive, so just look out for that, but it's a really fun one for that shaded environment. Excellent. One picture on the next one, and this is in one of those inferno strips, a little over two feet tall. Pull it or enjoy it. It's up to you. I would pull it. Um, it's a weed called rough fleabane or daisy fleabane. Um, it's in the Asteraceae family, so it'll make those nice little puff balls, and then you'll have way more next year. Um, so I'd go ahead and pull it and dispose of it before those seeds get um, ripe and viable. All right, and one picture on this one also. Uh, this is a Blair viewer who has blueberry bushes, wondering whether they should cut back the dead twigs now, and what is the issue? So blueberries like a pH of four and a half to five. Most of our pHs of Nebraska soils are over seven. So we're looking at a possibly a pH issue if they haven't changed that in that raised bed. Go ahead and prune out whatever is dead right now. It's probably not going to be coming back anytime soon. And then check the pH. Um, if you need to drop it down, add some sulfur to bring that down. Um, but that's gonna be your best bet and make sure that they're adequately watered, especially this year. All right, thanks Elizabeth. Well, we are very happy to have plants in the ground out in our garden, but the planting continues. Here's Terry James to tell us more out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we are finishing up planting. We're also making sure that all those little weeds are out of our garden and we're going to be putting a mulch down to make sure that we are protecting our moisture. Remember, parts of Nebraska have gotten quite a bit of moisture in the past few weeks, whereas parts have not received any, i.e. Lincoln, we're down like 10 inches of moisture so far this year. So we're really wanting to make sure that we're pres preserving all of that moisture for our plants to get up and growing well. We're also adding a few additional irrigation techniques. So we've double checked our in-ground irrigation to make sure all the heads are working properly. We are looking at adding a few uh, soaker hoses and stuff to some of those other beds just to kind of really make sure that all of our new plants are up and gr growing well. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right now, it is time for the lightning round. Elizabeth, are you ready? Yep. 
This is a Beatrice viewer who has a shrub Althea and it only has growth at the bottom. Should she cut it back? Sure, if it's not growing out the top, it's probably not going to. All right, this is a Columbus viewer who says uh, she needs to move her peonies now. She has no choice. Any advice on that one? Uh, make sure that they're adequately uh, watered, especially if you're trying to get them established again and All at right. the same level. The same level. All right. Uh, we have another viewer who needs to move some daffodils now. Is that possible? Sure. Um, go ahead and dig them up, put them where you need them to go, and then wait for that foliage to die down before you prune. All right. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer that had service berries that were covered with pollinators on the flowers. Flowers dried up, fell off, no fruit. What's up with that? It's the year. <laughs> All right, we have a viewer who has a nine bark that has dead branches. If he cuts them off 18 inches above the ground, will they grow back? No. All right. We have a viewer who visited the backyard farmer garden and wonders what is the black mesh over the greenhouse for? Usually it's a shade cloth. We're going to count that one, right? <laughs> it was a shade cloth. Okay, usually it's shade cloth. <laughs> All right. All right, Kyle, you ready? Of course. This is a Eastern Nebraska viewer who says it rained and now there are those orange things on the cedars again. Is that common? Uh, yeah, it's um, cedar apple galls. They are um, they'll just another flush. They can flush up to seven times per year, actually. So. All right, this is a Fort Calhoun viewer who had an old cherry tree that cankered. They cut the canker out and then they used bleach on the affected cuts. Cherry seems fine. They're wondering, was that a good solution and can they eat the cherries? Uh, you can eat the cherries. It was a serviceable solution, but that canker is going to come back because I doubt you got rid of all of it. All right. Uh, this is an Arlington viewer who wonders if you recommend anything for leaf spots on perennials. Nope. This is a Seward viewer who has a 27-year-old blue spruce that lost most of its limbs from the bottom up. Is that a disease or age? Uh, probably a combination of both. Um, it's, and it's been hard to be a tree the last few years. All right. This is a, uh, a viewer who has a rhubarb with yellow spots on the leaves. This has happened for three years. This is Omaha. Uh, it's probably some sort of physiogenic response to environmental conditions. You made that word up. Uh, I did. <laughs> Physiological. <laughs> okay. All right. Are you ready, Matt? Yes. All right. Uh, this is a viewer who wonders whether soil amendments such as humic acid are useful for lawn care. Uh, there is some truth to using humic acid. If it's put down in enough quantity, there can be some response with it. What kind of response? Question two. Oh, it'd be healthier plants, I guess, is the behind it. They're basically promoting more organic or more uh, microbe growth in the soils. All right. Uh, a North Bend viewer wants to know how to control pennycress in flower beds and in moss in her garden. Uh, I would say pull them because they're already seeded out, so you get rid of that seed for next year. All right. Uh, there is a Why Not viewer who wants to know how to kill sweet clover in the lawn without hurting trees. What's the product? Oh, that's going to be any combination product. Try and stay away from the dicamba, but those work best on those sweet clovers with a dip, big taproot. All right. Uh, we have a viewer who wants to have a repeat on the chemicals we use for the control of bindweed. Uh, quinclorac is the one that smokes bindweed. Okay, smokes it. All smokes right. It. <laughs> you ready, Wayne? I guess. This is an Oto County viewer who wonders, is there a sawfly-like larva that feeds on rhubarb leaves? I've not seen one on rhubarb, but there are some other caterpillars that will hit it. All right. Uh, we have an Omaha viewer who had a white pine with a woody, woolly aphid infestation. What is the treatment? Hose them off would be my first choice or an insecticidal soap. All right. Uh, this is a viewer who had uh, Yellow jackets in the fall, sort of lazy ones in the house. They couldn't find the nest. They did have the, the house sprayed. They're allergic. How do they know they're gone? Yellow jackets nests die back each year. They send out new queens that overwinter, and then those new queens will find a new nest. So you may be lucky and not have any this year. All right. This is a Shenandoah, Iowa viewer who described what she's calling red bubbles on her rose leaves. What are those? <laughs> those will be a gall. 
nothing to worry about. All right. Um, we have phlox plant bugs again. What are, we, what are we recommending for treatment on those? Oh, phlox plant bug. Get rid of the phlox, <laughs> or if you really need to, use a permethrin type product below the flower on the foliage portion with very good coverage on the underside of the leaves. All right. Thanks, Wayne. Nice job. Oh, look at that tie, and it looks like Elizabeth won. And plants of the week. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, this week we have some really nice plants of the week. Um, one of the yellow one is a fun scientific name to say. It's Zizia uh, with a Z. Uh, but what this one is is Golden Alexander. And this one is a really fun one because it attracts a wide range of pollinators from like wasps to flies to, I don't know, does it attract bees, Wayne? I don't see very many bees on it. Not bees. but. It does attract a wide range of pollinators and it's gonna get about two foot tall. Now, some people like this, some people don't. It tends to be kind of a cedar. Um, the thing to keep in mind with this is it is a really good rain garden plant um, and it does attract a wide range of pollinators. The other one that we have is going to be um, an iris and this is a fun iris. This is the fontanelle iris and this fontanelle iris is gonna be taller than those little Siberian iris. Um, so it's gonna be that two, two and a half foot tall. Uh, it's going to bloom this lovely purple color and then they're going to blow open like this. And the thing to keep in mind is this is also a nice rain garden plant as well. So a couple very nice rain garden plants that provide a lot of mid-spring color. Excellent. Thanks, Elizabeth. All right. Uh, one picture on this one. This is, uh, she's read several articles about ants on peonies, Culbertson, Nebraska. They, that's a myth. They do not help them bloom. All right. It's extra floral nectaries that the ants are drinking the nectar on. The plants do get added protection benefits from the ants, though. All right. Two pictures on this next one. This is a plasmid viewer. Peonies have these little black bugs, bugs between the petals. What are they? Well, those are sap beetles, but when I looked at that first picture really closely, there's something else boring in there, which would then cause the rots and other things to get going on that, and that was what attracts the sap beetles. All right, one pick on the next one. This is little insects on daisies. Good guys or bad guys? These are varied carpet beetles. I know they sound bad as a carpet beetle, but they are our recyclers. They eat a lot of dead, decaying things, so they're good. All right, and two picks on the next one. Uh, a hole in the ground, and she's wondering, did cicadas come up, and then all these little things were left over. What, what is this? Well, the hole is from birds foraging in the yard for worms, grubs, other insects. And those and things in the palm of the hand are not insect based at all. They're from plants. Okay, excellent. All right, two for you, Matt, on the first one. Uh, dead zoysia grass, that would make Rock happy. Yeah, right. This is, uh, she says, 30 years of zoysia and this year it's not doing anything, so is, is it dead? I would be hard pressed to believe it's completely dead. So if you go in there now, after getting a little bit of rain, we're getting later in the season, just rub down in and see if you can pull out any green shoots or stems. And that would tell you if there's nothing there, it's dead, you're going to have to do something. But eventually that zoysia from the edges that's alive is going to fill back in. All right, one pick on the next one. This is a Benson, Omaha area. Tall fescue and bluegrass, minimal weeds. He's, he's wondering, should he be doing a broadleaf control or pre-emerge with pendimentholin or uh, let it be? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you don't have any weeds there and you know there's an issue and you still want to get a pre-emergent out and maybe there's a little bit of crabgrass up, a product with the thiopere or dimension would help prevent any new crabgrass and broadleaf weeds as well. All right, one pick on the next one. This is a grass that has started to emerge. She's had it for eight years. She's never seen it before. Huge system of rhizomes. Yeah, and this one I'm not totally sure on. It could fit under a few different types of grass that grow like this. Uh, Johnson grass is one that comes to mind with me because it does look like the rhizomes and it shoots up everywhere and it's a pretty extensive root system. So digging those out and getting rid of them is probably the best option, but um, Treating those individual plants with glyphosate would be another option to try and get it down into the rhizomes. All right, and one more, and this is, uh, this neighbor has let this grass come up around his waterfall and his pond. They're pretty, but wonders whether it will spread and take over. Ah, uh, yeah, foxtail barley, and that one is, 
a pretty good seed producer. Right now it probably already has seeds on it that are gonna fall to the ground. So if you can pull those out and remove them, that'd be the way, best way to prevent it from going. And also they like to go in thin lawns or thin areas. So just promoting a healthier, thicker lawn. Excellent, nice job. All right, three picks on this first one and a fourth pick that's from a different location of the same issue, Kyle. So okay. Wahoo on the first one, two-year-old red oak leafed out, but they look lacy. And the other one is from Carney, and it's a 12-foot tall bur oak. So one, two, three, four, and they all kind of look the same. And we could have the same pictures from here on campus as well. This is oak leaf tatters. Um, primarily, it, hit, it hits white oaks more than more than a lot of our other oaks. Um, don't really know what causes it. Um, there is some some people think that there's some herbicide interactions, but. We also see it in when there's no herbicide out there. Um, really, it's just a thing that happens early in bud development. Um, doesn't appear to negatively impact the, the overall health of the tree, though. All right, and two picks on this next one. This comes to us from Eastern Plains, Colorado. This is junipers turning brown in the middle and wonders what he should do about that. Yeah, this is most likely either a Phomopsis um, blight or, or a Cercospora blight on the, on the junipers. Um, both, of the, both are fungal pathogens. Best thing to do would um, apply in a fungicide that contains chlorothalonil um, or a product like Captan should decrease it, but you'd want to apply that product in the spring. All right, thanks, Kyle. Elizabeth, two on this first one. Uh, this comes to us from Knox County, Creighton, Nebraska. Wonder, and he wonders, is this frost damage? So two picks, and we know the answer, don't we? We do know the answer, and we'll say what Kyle said the last time with oak leaf tatters, nothing to do about it right now. Make sure that that tree is in overall good health and gets about an inch of supplemental moisture a week. All right, one picture on the next one. This is a six-year-old ginkgo and uh, little leaves, and then the big ones, everything else is, looks healthy. That's just how the year has gone this year. Um, unfortunately, nothing you can do. It's caused by environmental. It's not a disease or anything to worry about. Just make sure that that tree is in overall good health and we do the watering and it should, it's probably gonna look like this the remainder of the year, but it's not gonna harm the tree. All right, <clears throat> one pick on the next one. This is Ord, uh, planted this last year and uh, did great last year, this year no buds, it's a red bud. And top branches snap, she's wondering uh, whether she should take it out or maybe let some of those shoots from the roots come back up. So your best bet's gonna be removal. If you were to leave those shoots that are down near the base, they're weakly attached to that root system um, and it's just gonna take the right weather conditions for them to come off of the root system. So I wouldn't even worry about it and just take them off completely. All right. This one is a uh, girdled cherry tree, and this is in Norfolk. She planted a North Star dwarf cherry tree two years ago. Wabbits got it, and what should she do about that? Same type of thing. A removal's gonna be your best bet. Um, not much you can do about it. The one that's on the screen is a linden, and we wanna make sure that we remove any of those suckers around the base of the linden. I'd also like to see if there's a root flare on the linden, because there's a possibility we could be planted too deep, which is why we're seeing a lot of suckers there too. All right, and once you start with those suckers, you got those suckers. Yeah, they're there. All right. Well, when you've worked hard to get your tomatoes, peppers off to a good start, only to find out later they have a rotten spot where the flower used to be, it can really be frustrating. Most of us have had a run in with blossom end rot. Scott Evans is here to explain what it is and if there is anything you can do to avoid it. Tomatoes are one of our favorite plants we like to plant in our vegetable gardens, but they don't come without their own problems. We've done previous segments on Backyard Farmer on how to select a tomato, staking, issues with fungus and even bugs. You can find those on our YouTube channel if you want to check those out. But today we want to talk about a specific problem called blossom and rot. Blossom end rot happens when the bottom of the fruit becomes black and sunken. Most of the times we tend to think this might be a disease like a fungus, but that is not the case. So you don't need to spray it with anything. 
What is actually happening, it's a calcium issue in the plant. The plant's having problems either getting the calcium out of the ground or moving it throughout itself. One of the things that can cause this is a true calcium deficiency in the soil. However, you're going to have to have a soil test to figure out if that is the case. Most likely what is happening with the plant is that we have damaged the roots when we planted it or when we were weeding around it or we have allowed the soil to dry out in between waterings. The best defense to help prevent this is to mulch the plants. We can use hardwood mulch, grass clippings, straw, hay, anything's going to really help keep those weeds down and help keep the soil evenly moist. Another reason why we can get blossom end rot in our plants is that we over fertilize. So make sure that you're not over fertilizing and not using a high nitrogen fertilizer. This can cause the plant push a lot of green growth. So the calcium is going to go to the stems and the leaves and not to the fruit. One of the things that we like to do is go inside and work on home remedies to help prevent blossom end rot. We want to grind up eggshells, water our plants with Epsom salt, and sometimes we even want to go as far as putting Tums or chalk in the soil. Now, some of those products do have calcium that will help the plant, but it's not immediately available. And we also have a chance of inviting critters into the landscape that might do more damage than good. Blossom end rot is not exclusive to tomatoes. We can see it on our peppers, our eggplant, cucumbers, melons, squash, most of our vine crops as well. So if you start noticing any of those fruits with the bottoms of the fruit starting to go soft or mushy, you might want to check out how you're managing them. We don't know what the weather is going to be like this summer in Nebraska, but there's a pretty good chance it's going to be hot and dry. And to get our vegetable gardens off to a great start this year, make sure that we're keeping them mulched and evenly watered. Thank you, Scott, and good luck to everybody who has those vegetables planted this season. You know, you can watch this and many other great features on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. We've been uploading those videos for years, so there is plenty of great content from extension staff and other professionals to help you keep that lawn green, your trees tall, and those vegetables ripe. Check it out after the show. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. We have a handful of announcements tonight. The first is the Benson Garden Walk, June 10th. Benefits the Omaha Public Library. Our second one is the 54th annual Monroe Meyer Garden Walk, also in Omaha, June 11th, 9 to 4 p.m. And our third one tonight is the Backyard Farmer. will be at Lauritsen Gardens, June 13th. The show is actually sold out, so you're going to have to watch us uh, not live sitting in the audience, which is going to be great fun for everybody, but you'll still be able to see us not live. All right, Wayne, one on this first one. This is a Lincoln viewer who came home from a 10-day trip and found an infestation of these. What are they and do they do damage? That's an ant queen. Came out inside and uh, looks like it might be dead since it's on its back, but hard to tell uh, from the photo. Uh, that happens sometimes. Okay, Check for damage. If most of our ants, you'd notice trailing. If it were carpenter ants, you have a water issue. So that's what you look for. All right. Uh, second one here is this is a cute little guy, antenna or longer than the body. What is this? It's a bush katydid did nymph. They're really colorful. They're fun to watch. Bush kitty did fun. All right. And two pictures on the next one. Uh, this is ants. And uh, she says her yard has been attacked by ants like these. They don't enter the house. She's got, she's seen them in lots of places and they, she, she knows that, you know, they smell differently or something. So, <laughs> so what's, well, what's the deal here? People are noticing the ants in their yards this year just more than normal because our grass is thinner. We haven't been getting the rain to wash down the ant hills. We haven't been getting the rain to wash the ant hills off the sidewalk. They've been there the whole time. They're not going to be causing damage. They're part of the ecosystem. Enjoy them. If they bother you in the cracks of your sidewalk, hose it out, use a crack sealer made specifically for sidewalks, and then you don't have to look at them in the middle of the sidewalk. All right, excellent. Okay, Matt, one, uh, one picture on this one. This is a Falls City viewer. She's tried pulling it out, and she says it returns a day later than she used a commercial 
chemical of some sort and still coming up. And then she dug everything out and screened the soil and <laughs> the daffodils are in water and she wonders what this is and how does she get rid of it. Yeah, it's a lovely weed for the summer. It's a uh, yellow nut sedge <laughs> and it's gonna continue to grow from rhizomes from the last 20 years. So I don't know what you're gonna do with this one. You're just gonna have to probably try and screen out that soil or remove the soil in that area and put new soil in if you don't wanna spray a herbicide. All right, and if she did want to spray a herbicide? Uh, sedge hammer is pretty safe on a lot of those ornamentals, so that one would be the choice that I have. All right, uh, your next viewer here, this is a Gretna viewer. He's wondering what this is and when to spray and for what. He has used 2,4-D, yeah. he's trying to get rid of it. Yeah, this one is tough to control with the uh, herbicides. It's Vinca Minor or Periwinkle, and it's pretty. It's got some flowers on it, it's got some foliage. So it roots at every node or grows along the ground and just kind of spreads out. So if you can remove it, try and dig out those nodes and don't leave any plants behind, which is impossible, because uh, they just shoot out new roots from that one. So that's probably gonna be the best bet. All right, one pick on this next one. This is a Beatrice viewer. Uh, wonders what this is. She thinks it came up in her wildflower seed. She wonders, is it a weed or is it a not weed? It <laughs> is a native weed, Pennsylvania pelletory, and it has really shallow roots, so just yank them out of the ground. Mm -hmm. Fun name on it. Okay, Kyle, one pick on this first one. This is a La Vista viewer, tomato plants. Uh, transplanted May 9th, three of the adjacent plants have also started turning yellow, primarily at the top of the plants. Could be a few things, could be a virus, um, could be herbicide drift if you're seeing it on other non, if it's on non-tomatoes, I would guess herbicide based off the time of year, otherwise um, potentially a virus um, issue. All right, and three picks on the next one. This is Elkhorn, three different varieties of determinate tomatoes. Just started showing this about 10 days ago. The new growth looks better. And this is a herbicide issue. And so the, with herbicide issues, it's the um, injury takes place at a certain time, affects those leaves. If it, as long as it doesn't kill the growing point, the new leaves come out just fine. All right, two pictures on the next one. Uh, this viewer has uh, contender beans with these splotches on the leaves. She's wondering, is this a virus? And we had another a viewer with a similar thing from west of Bradshaw. It's potentially a virus. Um, the uh, the uh, alfalfa mosaic virus will hit common beans um, and can cause those, those, those large blotches. There's also a bean mosaic virus that it could be. Um, but again, without, it, without actually testing, it's hard to say for sure if it is a virus issue. All right. Elizabeth, two pictures on this first one. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer. Uh, they say they have four aspens. Two of the four have this severe leaf curl. And uh, they had an application of bifenthrin from the tree service in April and then a frost. And what is this and what can they do? That looks like classic growth regulator herbicide injury with the epinasty and the curling and distortion of that leaf. Um, really not a whole lot you can do. Just make sure that they're adequately moist, you know, adequately watered. And it's just going to be a waiting game to see if it puts on new growth and grows out of it. All right, and the word epinasty for our viewers means I just what? learned it tonight, <laughs> Kyle. <laughs> it's distorted growth. Distorted growth, yes. but it was a fun way to throw it in there. <laughs> All right, All right. Uh, let's see. Then we have your next one is an Omaha viewer. One picture on this one. This, uh, they're saying the person that their lawn person mowed off a huge part of the root near the trunk. Is there anything can, that can be done? Um, nothing <clears throat> that can be done. I'm going to be surprised if they don't have any mower damage from taking out that large of a chunk. Um, be prepared for suckers to possibly show up in that wounded area, um, but we want to leave it open to the environment. We don't want to seal it or put paint or tar or anything on it. Just watch out for those suckers. And maybe mulch around that tree to keep I mean, it. that would be ideal. If your mower guy takes that big of a chunk out of your, your tree, you want to really pull that mulch out away so we don't have that happen again. All right. Two pictures on this one. Uh, this is a Humboldt, ne uh, Nebraska viewer, yellow spots on the vegetables. And it's almost everything. Cabbage, broccoli, green beans, beets, and zucchini. Yeah, I was going to throw this one back at Kyle, because, <laughs> but the probability of there being something that affects all of those different species is, you know, pretty it, hard. It's, yeah, it's really tough. I mean, it could be a virus, but who knows? Okay. 
Yep, I know. We'll, we'll just have to come back to that one, I think, and hope that things are okay. <laughs>